Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. I'm Barry Bryson, and we're continuing our study of 1 Peter. And we're in chapter 1, verse 22, and we're going to read through chapter 2, verse 3, um, which will conclude the second section and take us to the next to the next section. Um, the, the next point that he's getting to. It all moves really quickly. Uh, it really does. And everything is just locked in to the thing that was written before. The line of, of thought, of argument, is just so clear and tight um, that, that it really, in a sense, does a disservice to take it apart and to read a little bit of it day by day. It ought to be written, read all in one setting. Um, and um, so yesterday... Uh, we were talking about verses 13 through 21, um, and and about and we, we we saw reiterated the themes of faith, hope, and love, Father, Son, and Spirit, our new birth, and who we are now in a world that is sinful, and because we are who we are, who we ought to be in the midst of this world, and that's going to be continued uh, in these verses we're going to read today. There is there is the therefore, and there is the sense that are repeated. Sense is a different word, agnizo, than the therefore, but it contains the same urgency, the same inevitability of God's plan, the same um, logical, um, the, the, the same logical result that will come from what has happened before. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. If you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which I preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisy, and envy and slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the world, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. It's all just woven together so tightly, all the themes. They just, you can't pull them apart. And they're all here. The sense that therefore, our salvation, and, and, and because of that, who we ought to be, and, and, and the connection of faith, hope, and love. And these verses, chapter 2, 22 through verse, chapter 2, verse 3, the, the beating heart of these verses is the word love. Since we have in obedience, grace and obedience tied together, and, 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 and being, impossible, being impossible to pull apart, since you have obedience to the to the truth, purifies your souls for a sincere. That word is logikos, and sincere is probably the third best meaning of the word, but I'm not saying it's not the word, the meaning of the word here. Um, logical or natural. Uh, you know, it, 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 it continues to uh, further this notion, this the momentum of the inevitability of God's plan. It's the word that's used in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which is your reasonable service, your logical service, or your spiritual service or service of worship. Uh, tra English translations are all over the map with this word. That's that word, and it contains all those meanings. With sincere love of the brethren, it's the logical love that we'll have because God has loved us first. God loves us first, that's the first thing. And then, then we love Jesus. That's the second thing. And because those things are true, we love God and we love Jesus, even though we haven't seen him, then we are able, we have the resources to truly, logically, spiritually, sincerely love each other, fervently love each other, fervently love one another from the heart. He cannot say this in stronger words. He's talked about the logic, the sincerity, the spirituality of it, then the intensity of it, and then the source of it, from the heart, from the source of your will, from the very core of who you are, love each other. And that's the key to survival. You got to love each other. 
you don't love each other, it's not going to work. You can't do this by yourself. You can't do this by cocooning yourself off from each other. You can't do this in a vacuum. You have to have each other if you're going to survive. Because we've been born again, not of sea which is perishable, but imperishable. We are the eternals. We have eternal life. We have it now. We have it through, the, through our birth. Um, through the living and abiding word of God connects us with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that, that the word itself is the living and abiding. And it is through the word that was preached, the word that was communicated, the word that we connect with every day, that we maintain this eternal life. And then he talks about, and it reminds me so much of the end of First John chapter 2, that the earth as we experience it is temporary and is fading away. And he goes all the way back and, and he quotes the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 6, the very beginning of the suffering servant passage, taking them back to that prophecy that talks about Jesus' sufferings, to say that, that all flesh is like grass, its glory is like the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls off. This is all temporary here. But the word of the Lord abides forever, which John is going to say, in exactly those words. And this is the word which was preached to you. You have this. When I came to you, I preached this word to you, and you still have it. It was the word that converted you. It's the word that's still alive in you, and it's the word that brings you eternal life. Therefore, putting aside all malice. Okay, if you love each other, you got to get rid of these things. Malice, falsehood, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Th that cannot in any way be a part of who you are. You're like a newborn babe. Is that theme again of being born again? Okay, if you're a newborn, a newborn is not able to do any of these things. They do not have the emotional sophistication to do any of these things. They can feel love, and they can hold on to the person that loves them. That's what a newborn does. And that's what you need to do. And then grow from that place, because you're being fed by the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, that if, and that word tasted, of all our senses. This is a brilliant word. It's such a brilliant turn of phrase, and it's so evocative, and it just bears so much meaning. It's hard not to get choked up by this, especially if you love babies. At birth, our primary sense is taste, and it is always our most intimate sense. It's tactile and it's chemical all at the same time. And as babies start to experience the word, the world around them, what's the first thing they do when they pick something up? They put it in their mouths. They use the sense of taste as their primary sense in our earliest lives. And, and he talks about tasting. It's so precise and so real and so accurate. Tasting what? Tasting the kindness, the kindness of the Lord. We're drinking in the Word. We're fed by the pure Word, right? We're, we're, we're nursing upon the Word of God. But in that, we taste. What we taste on our tongues is the kindness of the Lord. It's, it's, it's God's love, concern. He's our primary caregiver, and we know that. In the same way that a nursing child knows that they're being held and cared for by a mother, um, who gave them life. We are being loved and cared for by a Father who's given us life. I will leave you with that beautiful image. We'll pick up at verse 4 next time.